Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, uh, Ambassador Emerson. Great to be with you. Thank it you. sounded as if you were planning to leave the stage just now, but I'm sorry. Actually, someone has questions. I've been asked to talk to you a little bit. And let's start right here in Berlin. Um, we've just counted the election nights, Rudi Galenz and I, and there are 10 in Berlin. This is the biggest one. It's great to have you here just now. But this whole city is on its feet tonight. Everyone is watching the elections, and we all are very keen to stay up with you until 6 a.m. in the morning. How, do you, how did you experience the past few weeks in Germany as U.S. ambassador, who has been asked very frequently to explain to us what is happening in your country and how this campaign could evolve the way, the way it did? Well, I think two, two observations on that. Number one, uh, as the American ambassador, it is deeply impactful to see how much ordinary Germans care about what's happening in the United States of America. And I wish Americans, more Americans, could understand how much people in Europe, in Germany, actually care about what's happening in our country. I think that would be something that would, uh, would impact them quite significantly. The second thing is I am so impressed by the level of sophistication of everybody in this room and the folks that I've been talking to up and down Germany about our electoral process because it's not an easy process. It's a confusing process. We have the primaries, we have the conventions, we have the debates, we have the electoral college. It's not a simple up and down vote. And when I talk to people, I mean, I can get into as detailed conversations about swing states and different voting groups with your typical German that I can with your typical American. In fact, maybe even better. So uh, that's been very impressive as well. I would say, John, that in addition to that thorough interest in, in your electoral system and the political system in the United States more generally, um, I, I would say that there is a huge degree of concern, in particular in the case of one possible outcome of tonight's elections. So what would you advise Germans to expect in both cases? And you have praised uh, and, and underlined the importance of the transatlantic relationship. Uh, when we make up to, tomorrow morning and there is a President Trump, what, that, what does that mean for our relationship? Well, I think what's, uh, first of all, I think regardless of who is president, that relationship will remain very, very important. But the fact is, with a President Trump, we really don't know exactly what we're going to get because he doesn't have a track record. He has never served in government before. And by the way, that's his appeal as a candidate. Because you have a lot of Americans that are so fed up with the political process, they're willing to turn over the card table and start with something completely new. But that's a reality. So we don't really know. But one thing we do know is, there has been, there is a very stark difference between these two candidates in terms of their view and approach towards foreign policy. And I think there's always been an isolationist stream within American politics. And Donald Trump very much represents that. It's more of an inward looking America first kind of approach to foreign policy. Hillary Clinton, on the other hand, is an advocate and a devotee of what has been a long held bipartisan foreign policy tradition, going back with Obama and Bush and Clinton and Bush and Reagan, which uh, basically holds as principles that America's national interest is uh, best served by a strong relationship with Europe, by an unwavering commitment to NATO, and by the understanding that shared prosperity around the world is in fact in our national security interest. So I think there is that difference between the two candidates, but you know, because President, uh, or, or if he is President, uh, President Trump has never been in office before, it also means that he's gonna be confronted with issues and with a way of thinking that he hasn't maybe thought about before. A lot of times people campaign on one thing and they get in there and they go, oh wow, I guess I can't really do that. So we'll, we'll, we'll just have to see. Thank you very much. Now, let's wind forward a bit. And if we look back at this election night and the campaign that we have witnessed over weeks from maybe early in 2017, would you say we will be looking back at this campaign as just an episode? 
or has the way this electoral campaign was actually driven, uh, the extent of polarization, uh, the accusations we have heard and, and which have been very closely followed by European media. Is this an episode or would you say there's something underway which is more fundamental, which is maybe related to the way media work these days, the way candidates play their game? Um, so has something fundamentally changed in American political culture and what do you see maybe of the same nature happening in Europe? I think there are two things. One that I believe is episodic, I certainly hope so, and that's the level of personal attacks that have been leveled in the course of this campaign, really from the beginning of the primary, certainly in one party. And I would hope that that is episodic, that people are sick of that, and that in fact if candidates indulge in that kind of behavior in the future, they get punished for it by the voters. The part that I don't think is episodic is exactly what you were talking about. The way the use of media has changed. The, the traditional media that evaluates sources, that does its research, that makes sure that it gets the truth out and the facts out, or at least has a commitment to that, sometimes they make mistakes, has been overrun in this campaign by social media, by 140 character tweets that end up dominating news cycles. And I think the, the media needs to take a very serious look at it. And I think we as societies have got to look at social media because social media has a tendency to put people in silos. You know, we just friend the people we like. We follow the people who already share our pre-existing point of view. And what happens is people just start sharing the same opinions back and forth, the same information, sometimes the same misinformation, because they're not everything on the internet is true, folks. And people say, oh, look what I saw, this is outrageous. And they go back and forth, and you get an echo chamber of misinformation and an echo chamber of anger that develops. And I think that one, that this is a contributing cause to the polarization in society, because people do not see uh, they, they just don't talk to people who have other points of view. They don't take the time to try to understand those other points of view. And I think that is a fundamental problem, not just for American politics, but for European politics as well. Thanks, John. As a, as a closing question, let me come back to something you said in your introductory remarks. You closed by saying, now the main task for whoever gets into office um, is to heal the country, to bridge those very deep divides. What can best be done to achieve that? It seems to be a huge political task. If I were the president-elect, what I would do in, in very early on, even in my transition, is I would go to some of the places where people were very much against me. And I would say, look, I know you weren't for me. I know some of you don't like me. And I know a lot of you don't trust me. But I also know you're hurting. I know you have concerns. I hear you that these, this is what those concerns are. And I, my commitment is I'm going to work very hard to try to address those concerns. I mean, I think that would be a good way to start. And then, of course, they have to follow through. So if I were Hillary Clinton, I'd go to West Virginia. I'd go to coal country. I'd go to places where people have lost their jobs because of the rapid pace of globalization and technology change. And if I were Donald Trump, I'd probably go to a place like East Los Angeles, where you have, uh, or many of the other cities in America, where you have significant immigrant populations, and talk to them. So, so we'll see. Thank you very much, Ambassador Amazon. So you're going to stay up until 6 a.m. to watch, and I know... I'm staying up through midday tomorrow, okay. so I'm, I'm up all Because I was night. just going to say, at 8 a.m. you have your event at the embassy. I know you'll be up I'll then. I'll be up for that, so... too. The only question is whether I'll have a shower beforehand. So you might want, not want to sit next to me. <laughs> we'll check that tomorrow morning. All Thanks right. so much for being with us. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks.